Hello ladies and gentlemen, in this video we will talk about oxygen transport. Myoglobin and hemoglobin are oxygen binding proteins. Hemoglobin is found exclusively in red blood cells where it facilitates the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide between lungs and peripheral tissues. Myoglobin is abundant in skeletal and cardiac muscles and serves to store oxygen. Now let's take a look at the structure of these proteins. Myoglobin has a tertiary structure as it's made of a single polypeptide chain folded into a spherical shape and contain a metal ion Fe2+. For this reason, myoglobin is described as a globular metalloprotein. Hemoglobin is also a globular metalloprotein, but it has a quaternary structure as it's made of four subunits two identical alpha chains and two identical beta chains, arranged in heterodimers to alpha beta. Each of these hemoglobin 4 subunits is very similar to the polypeptide chain making myoglobin. Myoglobin polypeptide chain consists of eight alpha helices denoted A to H, as well as each polypeptide chain of the hemoglobin's 4 subunit. Amino acids in each helix are numbered. For instance, histidine F8 is the eighth amino acid of the helix F. In both myoglobin and hemoglobin alpha helices, polar amino acids are found at the surface, while nonpolar amino acids are found at the core of the interior of the protein, except for histidine E7 and histidine F8, which are polar amino acids but are found in the core. These eight alpha helices surround a heme group, which is, in the red, which is the red structure in the figure. The heme is the non-protein part of hemoglobin and myoglobin. It's a prostatic group that exists in a hydrophobic pocket in both hemoglobin and myoglobin, and it's made of the protoporphyrin ring and the central iron atom. A closer look at the heme group reveals that it consists of a central ferrous iron, Fe2+, and a heterocyclic protoporphyrin 9 complex made of four pyrrole rings joined by methionine bridges. The iron porphyrin is planar and hydrophobic, except for two propionate groups exposed to solvent. Heme gives blood and muscles the red color when it's oxygenated and the purple-red color when deoxygenated. Now let's talk about the properties of the iron ion in heme. Fe2 plus can interact with six ligands. Four of these ligands are the nitrogen of the pyrrole rings. The fifth ligand is the, um, the imidazole side chain of histidine F8, which is known as a proximal histidine, as it's close to Fe2+, so it can bind to it directly. The sixth ligand is the oxygen molecule that binds to the iron perpendicular to the porphyrin ring, and it's stabilized by histidine E7, known as the distal histidine. As its name indicates, it's distal, which means it's far from Fe2+, and its role is to stabilize oxygen by hydrogen bond. Now the iron ion must always be in its reduced state Fe2+, in order to bind oxygen. Because if it's oxidized in hemoglobin into Fe3+, oxygen can no longer bind, and thus no oxygen will be delivered to tissues, and in this case, the blood will have a brown, a brown chocolate color. Since myoglobin is made of one subunit, it contains one heme group and thus it can only bind one oxygen molecule. Note that the iron is a part of the heme that binds to oxygen. Hemoglobin is made of four subunits and thus it contains four heme groups and can bind four oxygen molecules. In this part, we will talk about oxygen binding curves for hemoglobin and myoglobin. I will start with myoglobin. When oxygen binds to myoglobin, it forms an oxymyoglobin, MbO2. It is the form of myoglobin that stores oxygen in cytoplasm of skeletal and cardiac muscles.
Now this reaction is reversible, which means that on demand, oxymyoglobin MbO2 dissociates into Mb plus O2 to deliver the oxygen to the mitochondria that carry out the oxidative metabolism. Now, in order to measure the amount of oxygen bound to myoglobin, we should calculate Y, the fractional O2 saturation. It ranges from a value of 0 to a value of 1, where 0 means that none of the myoglobin contain oxygen, and 1 means that 100% of myoglobin are bound to oxygen. The equation of Y is the following. Y is equal to the partial pressure of oxygen divided by P PO2 plus P50. Since Y measures the amount of oxygen bound to myoglobin, we should have concentration of oxygen in the equation. But since oxygen is a gas, we commonly describe the concentration of oxygen by using the partial pressure PO2. P50 is the partial pressure of oxygen at which myoglobin is 50% saturated. In other terms, P50 is the value of oxygen at which Y is equal 0.5, where half of the ligand sites are occupied. P50 also reflects the affinity, which means that the lower the value of P50, the higher the affinity for oxygen. Now let's take a look at the graph. The y-axis represents the fractional O2 saturation y that ranges from the 0 to 1. On the x-axis, we see the partial pressure of oxygen, uh, which is given in either millimeter of mercury or torr, knowing that one torr is equal to one millimeter of mercury. The myoglobin has a hyperbolic curve, as you see. As the partial pressure of oxygen increases, there is a sharp increase in the curve until it becomes flat. What that means is, in the presence of a small amount of oxygen, myoglobin becomes saturated very quickly with oxygen. And this means that myoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen, which is consistent with its role as an oxygen storage molecule. As I have already said, the partial pressure, P50, reflects the affinity. And the lower it is, the higher the affinity of myoglobin for oxygen. So let's see what is the P50 for myoglobin. In order to obtain P50, first of all, you should draw a horizontal line at y equals 0.5. That, uh, that would, will touch the curve. Then you will draw a perpendicular line, the x-axis from that intersection point. And the partial pressure, uh, P50, of myoglobin is equal to 4 torr. This means that a partial pressure of 4 torr is needed for myoglobin to be 50% saturated. And this low value reflects the high affinity that myoglobin has for oxygen. Now let's talk about hemoglobin. At the level of lungs, hemoglobin binds oxygen to form HbO2, oxygenated hemoglobin or oxyhemoglobin. This reaction is reversible, which means that HbO2 dissociates into hemoglobin plus O2 to deliver the oxygen to tissues. Now, the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin is measured by Y, the fractional O2 saturation, and if you have noticed, it is the same as that of myoglobin, but with an exponent N. N is the Hill coefficient. It measures the cooperativity among ligand binding sites. And the maximum value of N is equal of the number of binding sites, which is 4, in case of full cooperative binding. N is determined experimentally, and the normal value of N for an adult hemoglobin is 2.7. If the Hill coefficient is equal to 1, we get the same equation of that of myoglobin, which reflects the absence of cooperativity between subunits, and this case is seen in some hemoglobin mutants. Now let's take a look on the oxygen binding curve of hemoglobin. First of all, the shape of the curve is different than that of myoglobin. It's not hyperbolic, it's sigmoidal. In the next slide, I will explain more about the sigmoidal shape and its meaning. The second difference is in the value of P50, which, all, which is always, always obtained for Y equals 0.5. P50 of uh, hemoglobin is equal to 26 torr, higher than that of myoglobin equal to 4 torr. Remember that a lower value of P50 corresponds to, to a higher affinity and vice versa. So hemoglobin having a higher P50 will have a lower affinity for oxygen.
and this is consistent with its role as an oxygen carrier. Unlike myoglobin, hemoglobin doesn't bind tightly to oxygen in order to be able to release it easily for tissues. In the previous slide, we talked about hemoglobin having an S-shaped curve, also known as sigmoidal shape. But what does it indicate? The graph analysis will reveal the answer. So let's start with it. When the partial pressure of oxygen begins to increase, you see a very slight increase in the fractional O2 saturation. This means that hemoglobin exists at first in a state that doesn't like oxygen. But as the amount of oxygen or the partial pressure of oxygen available increases more, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen increases and hemoglobin goes from a confirmation that doesn't like oxygen to a confirmation that really wants oxygen. And you see that with a very sharp increase on the curve as more and more oxygen is binding until you get to a point where hemoglobin is fully saturated with oxygen. So in conclusion, the sigmoidal curve indicates the presence of a cooperativity between the hemoglobin subunits in binding oxygen. And that, when oxygen binds to the first subunit, it induces a conformational change in the next subunit, allowing it to bind additional oxygen. This is the cooperative behavior between the hemoglobin subunits. Of course, such a behavior doesn't exist in myoglobin because it, it's made of just one subunit. Hemoglobin has two different conformations called the tense state and the relaxed state. The deoxygenated form of hemoglobin, which is the tense state, resists oxygenation because it is stabilized by hydrogen bonds and interchain ionic bonds. These interactions are broken in the oxygenated form, the R uh, form, or the relaxed form. So when I said in the previous slide that hemoglobin goes from, a, from a, a confirmation that doesn't like oxygen to a confirmation that really wants oxygen, I was talking about the hemoglobin going from the T state to the R state. When oxygen binds to a first subunit of hemoglobin, it disrupts the hydrogen and the ionic bond existing between the heterodimers and it induces a 15 degree rotation of one dimer with respect to the other, allowing another oxygen to bind to the next subunit and so on. So the binding of one oxygen increases the affinity of hemoglobin to bind more oxygen. And if we want to relate this to the P50, a lower value of P50 reflect a, high, a higher affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, which stabilize the R state, and a higher value of P50 reflect a lower affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, which stabilize the T state. In the next video, we will talk about the factors that affect the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. Thank you for your attention.